Hello, my name is Glenn Hall, and today is March 26th, 2021. This particular video is called The Mystery of the Firstborn and is a continuation of the parables of Passover and why we should be celebrating Passover and not Easter. Tonight, <clears throat> tonight begins the biblical day of Passover. Nisan 14 begins at dusk today, March 26th, 2021. Tomorrow is the day of Passover. I myself intend to have a leg of lamb with my family in celebration of the Passover, and that has become a tradition since, pretty much since we learned the great significance of Passover um, in 1997. It was 1997 that uh, I had uh, been a Christian for 20 years. <clears throat> and I thought I understood some things about the uh, Word of God at that time. Um, God really began to wake me up then. Um, and that awakening is still occurring. Let me tell you a little story of something that happened uh, to me in uh, 1997. It was in the springtime, and the spring of 17, or uh, 1977 was when the Lord apprehended me and revealed his word to me. So this was almost exactly 20 years later. It was the time, if you recall, if you're old enough to recall, that people were talking about the Hale-Bopp comet. And there were people, and particularly in a a website at that time called the Five Doves, people who were looking for the return of the Lord, who were saying that the hale Bob comet was a harbinger of the return of the Lord. Well, at that time, I was a Missouri state representative. I was just beginning my third term. And um, one day I was in the capital city, Jefferson City, and I decided I'm gonna go out and see this comet. Uh, so I went uh, about 30 miles out of town to a wilderness area, and uh, I looked up into the sky looking for the comet, and I had no problem seeing it. It was a beautiful, clear night, and I saw this magnificent image in the sky, a ball with a tail behind it, and as I looked at it, I th see, I'd been hearing it was coming for couple of months, but this was right about the closest time it was going to be here, but I hadn't bothered to look. I had not bothered to look for months, but I looked at it, and when I looked, it looked to me like it was going away from the earth, that it had already come to its closest approach, and now it was leaving. So I looked at it, and I said that to myself, it looks like it's leaving, not approaching. And when I said that to myself, the Lord spoke to me and said, if that had been me, you would have missed my coming. That was huge. If that had been me, you would have missed my coming. Well, I determined that I was not going to miss the Lord's coming and I have been diligently watching now for 24 years. <clears throat> and I have thought that the coming of the Lord was imminent quite a few times. This is one of those times. I believe the Lord's return is imminent. I believe we are in the end times. And I believe that the return of the Lord is at hand. But the question is, what will that return look like? See, that's the thing. Will people miss Jesus this time like they missed him the first time? Consider my words. Consider my words. Will people, especially Christians, because remember it was the Jews who rejected Jesus and killed him. This time, is it possible that Christians, people who say they believe in Jesus, people who call themselves by his name, is it possible that they will miss the second coming of Christ? I believe it is because I, I 
believe that most of the church does not know what to look for. And that's why they still celebrate Easter instead of Passover. But Passover is filled with prophecies concerning the time we live in and the second coming of Christ. And this particular lesson today, the mystery of the firstborn, we'll get into that in quite a bit of detail. Take notes. God called Moses in the wilderness in order to do a specific work with respect to his firstborn. The scripture says, and this is Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Exodus 4, 21 to 23. Now recall that later at the first Passover, sometime after this word um, came to Pharaoh, Moses instructed all Israel to select a lamb for slaughter and to place some of its blood on the doorposts and the lintel of each house. Blood had to be applied there or else the death angel of God would strike and kill every firstborn person and beast in that household. Since none of the Egyptians observed this Passover, every Egyptian household suffered death of their firstborns, both human and beast. Exodus 12 verse 12 says this, For I will pass through through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And then in Exodus 12, verse 29, he says this. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. Now, immediately after this first, This first Passover, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. That's Exodus 13, verse 2. And after this, in Exodus 13, verses 11 through 16, Moses instructed the people like this. He said this, When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Notice this. Every firstborn of a donkey. Why does he mention a donkey? Well, it's interesting that as you look through the scripture, donkeys prophetically speak of stiff-necked believers like Saul and like other Christians. Um, Ishmael was called a wild ass of a man. So he was a donkey. He was like a donkey, very stubborn. And so the donkeys, they had to be redeemed with the lamb. We, who are very stubborn people, we have to be redeemed with the lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So all men must be redeemed. And when in time to come your son asks you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. God is bringing us out of a house of slavery. It took the man Donald Trump to show us just how great the slavery is that we suffer. And I tell you, we suffer slavery. We are not free to even speak. And if you haven't realized that yet, you are not watching what's going on. 
For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore, I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but so all the firstborn of the stock, the cows, the lambs, the goats, they were sacrificed to the Lord. But all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or as frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. That's Exodus 13, verses 11 through 16. Later, when Moses begins to expound God's revealed laws to his redeemed nation, he says, You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the overflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. Exodus 22:29. Later, he says again, All that open the womb are mine, all your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep. Exodus 34:19. Now, in the scripture, Egypt is a type of the world. To be a type of means that it prophetically represents something. So Egypt represents the world. And so when people, throughout the Old Testament, you have the people of God wanting to go back to Egypt in order to be safe. But the world does not offer safety. And that's why John says, do not love the world or the things of the world. Now, in this parable of the Passover, uh, dealing with Moses and Pharaoh, Pharaoh represents Satan in the parable of the Ten Judgments upon Egypt. Although, Pharaoh represents God in the, in the parable of Joseph feeding all the world during the seven-year famine. Joseph himself is a type of Christ and a type of the overcomer in that parable. So, God's passing over or saving the firstborn Israelites in the first Passover has prophetic meaning as well. In the past, we have only considered the Passover related to spiritual salvation, which comes by simple faith in the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. And again, that's, that's where the church has been for 2,000 years, and they rarely get beyond that. Now, as we consider the 15 or more regulations which God imposed upon observing Passover, we see that Passover really relates mainly to the firstborn. Passover does affect everyone else in the household as well because they are kept safe by the presence of the firstborn who believes in the efficacy, the efficiency of Christ's blood, the Lamb. And they are the ones, the firstborn are the ones who obey the Passover regulations. An example of this is seen in Rahab of Jericho. Everyone who gathered in her house, based upon her faith in the God of Israel, and that faith was displayed in the red cord hanging from her window, which prophetically speaks of the blood of Jesus. Everyone in her household in her house, who came to her house, was saved from the slaughter when Israel killed every living thing in Jericho. The question we face today is, who the firstborn represents with respect to our Christian faith? What is the firstborn? What does the firstborn mean with respect to us? Before Israel's second Passover, the Lord does a very strange thing. He substitutes an entire tribe of Israel, the tribe of the Levites, for all the firstborn males of Israel. Now we're going to read this from Numbers chapter 3, verses 5 through 13. Uh, it just occurs to me that I wrote a book uh, about 20 years ago called When We Awake that you can find on my website that talks a lot about these things that I'm talking about now. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, 
Bring the tribe of Levi near, and set them before Aaron the priest, that they may minister to him. They shall keep guard over him and over the whole congregation before the tent of meeting, as they minister at the tabernacle. They shall guard all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, and keep guard over the people of Israel as they minister at the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are wholly given to him from among the people of Israel. And you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall guard their priesthood. But if any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. Why put to death? See, people presume to come near to God. We cannot approach God presumptuously. The Levites were chosen specifically to come near to God. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine, for all the firstborn are mine. So the Levites represent all the firstborn. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for my own all the firstborn in Israel, both of man and of beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. Numbers 3, 3, verses 5 through 13. Now, Moses expounds upon this idea a couple more times in the book of Numbers. First, we're going to read from uh, Numbers 8, verses 14 to 22. Thus you shall separate the Levites from among the people of Israel, and the Levites shall be mine. And after that, the Levites shall go in to serve at the tent of meeting, when you have cleansed them and offered them as a wave offering. For they are wholly given to me from among the people of Israel. Now it's interesting in verse 15, it says, And after that... The, the Levites shall go in to serve at the tent of meeting when you have cleansed them and offered them as a wave offering. So they were offered as a wave offering, these people. And as you read the scriptures, you realize that there is a special feast. It's, it's the Feast of First Fruits that occurs on the day after the Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And... That was when Jesus was offered as a wave offering to God. And so he prophetically fulfilled this feast of first fruits, which here we see is part of uh, what was required to consecrate the firstborn. Now here we are in uh, Numbers 8, chapter Chapter 8, verse 17. For all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both of man and of beast. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated them for myself. And I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the people of Israel to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the people of Israel that there may be no plague among the people of Israel when the people of Israel come near the sanctuary. So they stood between God and the people. They were to make atonement. They were to make the offerings for the people. Verse 20. Thus did Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel to the Levites, according to all that the Lord commanded, Moses concerning the Levites, the people of Israel did to them, and the Levites purified themselves from sin and washed their clothes. And Aaron offered them as a wave offering before the Lord, and Aaron made atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that, the Levites went in to do their service in the tent of meeting before Aaron and his sons, as the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so they did to them. So that was Numbers 8, verses 14 to 22. And now we're going to read from Numbers 18, verses 6 and 7. And behold, I have taken your brothers, the Levites, from among the people of Israel. They are a gift to you, given to the Lord, to do the service of the tent of meeting. And you and your sons with you shall guard your priesthood, 
for all that concerns the altar and that is within the veil, and you shall serve. I give your priesthood as a gift, and any outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Numbers 18, verses 6 through 7. This idea of substitution is something we see time and again in Scripture. For as a rule, the actual firstborn child of a biblical character is usually disqualified. Adam was the firstborn son of God, Cain the firstborn of Adam, Ishmael the firstborn of Abraham, Esau the firstborn of Isaac, Reuben the firstborn of Jacob, and Manasseh the firstborn of Joseph. These were all disqualified for one reason or another. David was the, fir- was the lastborn, not the firstborn, of Jesse. And David's firstborn, Amnon, was rejected in favor of Solomon. Solomon was the second son of David's infamous treachery and adultery with Bathsheba. Every single one of these firstborn sons was disqualified for spiritual rule for one reason or another. Finally, when we come to the biblical record of Jesus, God calls him his, quote, only begotten son, forgetting Adam altogether. But remember, Adam is called a type of Christ. I believe, I personally believe Adam will be found to be an overcomer because I think he willingly chose to die for his bride, for Eve. Later, The apostles Paul and John called Jesus the firstborn from the dead. So in Romans 8.29, Paul says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he, that is Jesus, might be the firstborn among many brothers. Have you ever thought of yourself as a brother of Christ? That's something Um, to think about. And then in uh, Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20, Paul says this, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Remember in the beginning, the scripture says that God made man in his own image. So why does Paul make a point that Jesus was the image of the invisible God. Because the creation was not finished. This entire history that we've lived through has been the creation of man, where God is making man into his own image. Jesus was the firstborn of all creation. He is the first totally, the first man who was totally the image of God. And then uh, still continuing in Colossians 1, verse 16. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. And in everything that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is one of the great scriptures that deals with the salvation of all. Jesus died to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. So that's Colossians 1, verses 15 through 20. And then John in Revelation 1, verses 4 and 5 says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. Jesus, the firstborn. Revelation 1 Verses 4 and 5. Okay, now let's continue with understanding this mystery of the firstborn. 
The Bible reveals that only two men exist in God's mind concerning his creation, Adam and Jesus. In um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 to 55, it says this, Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, or a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. <clears throat> Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. That's a wonderful promise. We all bear the image of the man of dust. Are you working toward bearing the image of the man from heaven? Are you working out your salvation in fear and trembling? See, this is talking about the intrinsic nature, our intrinsic nature, our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, what we think, what we love, what we want, what we aspire to be. It says, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Do you aspire to that? The overcomer does. The Kodeshim do. The holy ones do aspire to that. I tell you this, brothers. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 to 55. So the typology of the firstborn shows that that concept speaks of Jesus Christ, not Adam. This is because the term firstborn is a spiritual concept, not a natural one, not a fleshly one. Adam was the firstborn after the flesh. Jesus is the firstborn after the spirit. He is the firstborn from the flesh. This explains why God substituted the Levites for the natural firstborn Israelites. The Levites were chosen to do the spiritual work for Israel. As such, they demonstrate those who faithfully follow and obey God. The Levites typify overcomers. They typify the Kodeshim. They typify the holy ones which in our scriptures is translated saints, they typify the holy ones according to the following passage. This is Malachi 3, verses 1 through 5. This is the last, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. We saw this fulfilled once, didn't we? We saw it fulfilled 2,000 years ago when Jesus came to the temple of the Jews. And today you still have false teaching looking for a temple in ancient Israel, in Jerusalem, but what is he talking about? What is God's temple today? You are that temple. You are that temple. So I'm going to read this verse again. Malachi 3.1 Behold, I send you my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Suddenly come to the Kodeshim. This is talking about glorification. Many prophecies in Scripture have at least two fulfillments. The first one was when Jesus came. 
The second one is the second coming of Christ. What will it look like? Think about it. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Who can stand it? I'm going to have to bring some scripture here um, to recall. We went over this yesterday, but this bears repeating. Isaiah 33. Verse 14, the sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. The sinners in the Christian church are afraid. Do you see that? That's today, Zion. The sinners in the Christian church are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. They have every right to be afraid because they never followed Christ. They never walked in his way. Instead, they said they had grace to sin. Do you see it? My God, how corrupt has the church become. I'm going to continue with that. But there's another scripture that we need to look at after this. In 1 John 2 and 3. So, Isaiah 33, verse 14, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? Going back to Malachi for a second. Malachi 3, verse 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. And they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former days. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Now, along that same theme, let's look at 1 John chapter 2 going into to chapter 3. Chapter 2, verse 28, 1 John. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Do you see this? John is saying that there will be some who have no confidence and will shrink from him at his coming. Is that not what Malachi is talking about. Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Who? If you know that Jesus is righteous, Back to 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Then chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. See, the Kodeshim have not yet been glorified. It has not yet appeared what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. 
That's what John says here. We shall be like him. Can you imagine that? Have you seen pictures of Christ in the Bible, what he looks like now? Flaming fire. Look, at, read the book of Revelation beginning to end and see what Jesus looks like to John. And then John ends this short little passage in John, 1 John 3, verse 3. It says, everyone who thus hopes in him, in other words, hopes to be like him, purifies himself as he is pure. So I urge you, purify yourself as he is pure. So there are those, there are those Levites, spiritual Levites, who will be ready at the time of the second coming. But many will not be ready. Ezekiel 44. is very poignant concerning this. Ezekiel 44, and I'm going to read just a small portion of this. This is uh, verses 15 to 19, but I urge you to read all of Ezekiel 44. Starting with 15. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the people of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister to me. The sons of Zadok remained faithful to the Lord when all the rest of the Levites of Israel went astray. Similarly today, there are the Kodeshim, there are the, the holy ones who remained faithful when all the rest of the supposed spiritual Levites, that is the Christian church, remember, they were, Peter says, we are a holy priesthood. How much of the Christian church is a holy priesthood? So when that holy priesthood, who were the Levites, they went astray. The Christian church en masse has gone astray. 15 again, Ezekiel 44, 15. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary, the Kodeshim, who kept the charge of my sanctuary, when the people of Israel, when the church went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. Remember, the promise of God to the Levites is that he would be their possession. God would be their inheritance. That's what this is talking about. When they enter the gates of the inner court, they shall wear linen garments. They shall have nothing of wool on them while they minister at the gates of the inner court and within. So here they are within New Jerusalem. They are within the presence of God. They are in the presence of God, and therefore these linens represent their glorified bodies. That's what they look like. But they shall have nothing of wool on them while they minister at the gates of the inner court and within. They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen undergarments around their waists. They shall not bind themselves with anything that causes sweat. Everything is done perfectly in, in, in perfect purity here. And when they go out into the outer court to the people, so when they leave New Jerusalem, when they leave the presence of God, and they go out to the outer court, when they go out into the world to the people, they shall put off the garments in which they have been ministering and lay them in holy chambers. And they shall put on other garments lest they transmit holiness to the people with their garments. Well, just as no one can see God and live, 
The reality is that no one will be able to see the Kodashim in their glorified bodies and live. <clears throat> and so, again, it's going to be a matter of faith, isn't it? Who is this person that suddenly can do all these things? Who suddenly just seems to walk in perfection? What, what is this people are going to think? Has Christ really come in the flesh? Scripture makes no mistakes. The Levites discussed in Ezekiel 44 verses 15 through 19 are the sons of Zadok for a reason. They are the priests of the order of Melchizedek. Zadok, which means righteousness, which means justice. They are priests of righteousness. They are priests of justice. Kodeshim are priests of the order of Melchizedek. The firstborn are priests of the order of Melchizedek, just as Jesus was. Read Hebrews chapter 5 verses, I mean, Hebrews chapters 5 through 7. Those chapters deal with the priesthood of Melchizedek, and it's very important, especially the very end of Hebrews 5, when it talks about leaving the milk of the word and beginning to eat the meat of the word. Food is scripture in the word. Food is the word of God in the Bible. These priests described in Ezekiel 44 are the firstborn of creation after Jesus. They are the first fruits unto God who are made alive. That is, they are given glorified bodies according to Paul in this verse, this passage. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 20 to 26. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All. That's what it says. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So Christ was the first resurrected from the dead. Then there is the glorification of the first fruits. And then at his coming, and he comes in a cloud, he comes in his people. He comes in the first fruits. He comes in the Kodeshim. Read Revelation chapter 19 about uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb and Christ coming to establish the kingdom. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Okay, that's the thousand years, the millennium, which could well last far longer than a thousand years because that is going to be a time when every creature in heaven, on earth, and under the earth is brought into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. When they are purged of their sins, when they repent of their sins, they come to faith and they decide and believe that righteousness is the way to live. For Jesus must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now we should be able to see that the Feast of Passover primarily relates to the firstborn of creation, God's overcomers, the Kodeshim. They are the ones who fulfill Passover by not only applying the blood of Christ to their lives by believing in him, that is faith, but they also work out their salvation by obeying the other Passover regulations. And we've looked at a couple of those, one of which is to live a life without leaven, a life without sin, and a life without hypocrisy. 
Another is to be roasted in fire, to accept the purging of the Spirit, to accept the fire of God burning out the dross, burning out the evil, burning out the sin in our lives. At this time in history, in fact, all of history until now has been the culling, the, the pulling out of the Kodeshim. Because it's going to be the Kodeshim who will take the gospel, who will take the truth to all the earth so that the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And they will be able to do it because in fulfillment of the prophecy to the overcomers of the church of Thyatira, they will rule with a rod of iron. The rod of iron is the law of God. They will bring God's rule to the entire world, but that rule will be a rule of love, a rule of mercy, a rule, a, a rule of truth, mercy and truth, righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. That's what's coming to the world. We see the results of unrighteousness ruling the world, and it is ugly. It is profoundly ugly. But the kingdom of darkness is about to be destroyed.